our next talk is understanding technical and enterprise trade-offs in cybersecurity. So without further ado, please welcome our speaker, Vanessa Redman. Over to you. Good evening, good evening. Thanks everyone for staying um, for the late, late talks, for the end of the uh, B-sides. I hope everybody's had a good B-sides experience so far. Um, we're going to talk about a topic that could take way more than 15 to 20 minutes, so it's going to feel a bit fast, um, and that's okay. You know, feel free to come and see me, and we can talk over drinks about this topic for a lot longer time, for sure. But hopefully this will just get you a good introduction uh, to the topic itself uh, and have some key words in there that you would recognize and that you can use later on. So today what we're going to be talking about, we'll go through the obligatory who is. I have a little disclaimer rant. Won't take long, I promise. We'll talk about understanding the IT landscape, the human landscape, and some of the classic examples that if you haven't seen, you almost will see of times and topics in which you think that maybe your business, your organization should do this, and they say, mm, how about we do this instead? Uh, and we'll go over a few of those. You'll probably recognize a couple of them. And then we'll talk about the heart of the matter, mitigating and compensating controls. So a little bit about me. You don't have to read all of this. Essentially, I work in financial services uh, as part of the CISO group uh, in information assurance. So I mostly deal with second line control testing of security applications and tools as well as handle the cyber threat intel program. Prior to that, I spent 10 years in the Air Force where I was an F-15 jet engine mechanic for a bit before I transitioned over into cyber warfare. There, I worked as a tech lead for a red team and I also taught at the weapons school here at Nellis Air Force Base. I have my bachelor's in computer science, my SEC plus certification, my special nerd topic that I really like to study is algorithmic uh, game theory. That's usually what I give presentations on. So uh, these kind of more soft skill topics are a little bit different for me. Um, but I always bring game theory somewhere in there. So you'll definitely see that here. Uh, I also wrote an essay in the book 97 Things Every Information Security Professional Should Know that came out last fall. Uh, spoiler alert, it's on research. And if you can't tell, I'm originally from Louisiana. So before we get started, I always like to explain to people, if you don't already know, the number one answer in cybersecurity is it depends. This presentation and the things that I go over, it depends also applies there. What I'm saying is not absolutely you should not do this and you must do this. It's all going to be subjective. It's all going to be particular to your industry, to your experience. So everything here, take it purely from a, I've seen these things out and about, you may too. Maybe this will help you, maybe it won't. Um, and that's okay. The whole point of this is to kind of create that discussion. And if you absolutely disagree or absolutely agree, uh, agree with what I'm saying, come see me and let's have a discussion. I'd love to like argue and, you know, commensurate either one. Always for my presentations, I like to give a slide of why should I care? Why does this matter? What is the importance here? And if you haven't heard something along these lines before, uh, you probably will at some point or some derivative of. Um, we don't have a problem with this. Why are we talking about this now? We've never had a ransomware attack. Why should we do anything about ransomware? You think that maybe you wouldn't like have those at some point, you, somebody will ask, why, why should we worry about this? We've never been hit by that. Or maybe somebody says, yeah, we could implement that tool, but that's totally not going to work for our environment. These sound very negative. They sound very, oh, I just don't want to do this security stuff. But as we'll discuss, there's a little bit more to it. No doesn't just mean no. There's always a little something extra there. So some of the examples in which good doesn't always win, now these are great things, right? Multi-factor authentication, password policies, these are things that we absolutely 
should have, and there are different ways that you can implement these kind of controls. For MFA, there is a lot of discussion about things like maybe text-based MFA. Should you have SMS MFA? A lot of people, particularly now, would be like, absolutely not. That is not great MFA. Maybe you want to do uh, a third-party app version, and maybe that's what you present. And then somebody goes, no, you know, that, that's a lot of work. Maybe that's a lot of money. Maybe that's something that doesn't really fit for our environment. Let's just do SMS MFA. It's an example of it, it kind of gets you there, but maybe it's not what one would consider the best solution. And that's kind of at the heart of what this talk is about. Password policies. People argue organizations always differ on complexity, length, uh, how often you should rotate your passwords. I often like to ask people, uh, especially um, maybe in mock interviews and such, what is your stance on password policies? And other, other than, you know, yes, we should have them, you know, should you rotate passwords? And a lot of times people are like, absolutely, like every six months or every whatever. And then I'm like, well, that's interesting because in 2017, NIST published a publication that said that you shouldn't rotate passwords. So what do you think about that? And that usually like raises some eyebrows because, you know, I mean, that's been around for a, a, 2017, it's been around for a minute, right? But not rotating passwords still is not necessarily a common thing. Why would we maybe not want to rotate passwords? Maybe it's because if you're having to create new passwords every six weeks, then your passwords inherently get weaker and weaker as you go along because you're having to remember these passwords and you're not supposed to write them down or what have you. So that's another example in which you have a password policy, but maybe it's not a, an extremely strong password policy. And it's a classic example that cyber professionals, security professionals sometimes um, get a little discouraged by because it's not the best that we can do, but it's the best that we can do right now. Tool rationalization. Here I put this in because I think that it's interesting. Something that we're seeing more and more lately is everybody wants to buy a bunch of tools and do a bunch of things, but nobody's communicating amongst the teams and the departments who's buying what tools and for what purpose. So you have a lot of dual tools out there that can do multiple things, but the teams are siloed and they have their own budgets, and so you have kind of tool bloat. Another example. So understanding the IT landscape. Typically what you see, you know, a lot of people are used to seeing a network map when you're talking about IT landscape, but I'm not necessarily talking about the technical landscape here. I'm talking about the way that the department operates that's a little unsaid. It's not in policies and procedures. It's kind of like maybe the culture of the IT department. Understanding where security stands in that enterprise. Is security respected or is security just that team that you have to deal with because somebody said that we had to? It's important to understand that landscape so that you can understand what your bargaining power is and what kind of environment you're walking into when it comes to promoting a certain security posture and maybe different ways in which you're going to be able to do that. Understanding budgetary constraints. This is a big one. If you walk in and you're like, it's security, it's important, you need to spend X amount of money, that's just not how it goes. That's how we want it to go, but that's not realistic of how it goes. So you need to understand budget cycles and budget restraints. If it's already not maybe in a roadmap for this year, then you have to understand and adjust to the fact that maybe you have to put that in the budget for next year. And moving parts and dependencies. IT departments are, can be very, very complicated. Whole enterprises with lots of maybe legacy systems, third-party applications, there can be a lot of complexity there. It's, not, it's almost certainly not a, certain, a, a simple network. Because of that, you have to understand how to bob and weave and apply your security principles or promote your security posture knowing things like legacy systems. 
Next is the human landscape. Here's my game theory reference. So I love reading about um, selfish behavior, not malicious selfish behavior, but the fact that humans are just inherently selfish. A prime example of this, a, a game theory example, is the brace paradox. And essentially what it is, and this is a real simplification of the paradox, is you have two ways that you can go to work, two different paths, and everybody's used to their one path. At some point, maybe the Department of Transportation creates a shortcut, and it's going to reduce your time, say, by 15 minutes. What used to be a 45-minute uh, drive is now a 30-minute drive. Instead of thinking, now everybody's going to want to take that shortcut, you, want, you immediately take the shortcut, and then it takes you an hour to get to work because of the traffic jam because everybody took the shortcut. You know, you weren't thinking of second and third order effects. You weren't thinking about what everybody else was doing. You were just thinking, this is a shortcut that's going to reduce my time by 15 minutes. But everybody else was thinking the same thing. So then it's not a shortcut at all. So understanding that, especially, and we, you can apply that to passwords as well. Do people, is somebody going, I am going to laugh in the face of the security professional and create a really simple password? No. They're like, oh, another, I have to create another password for this application? Well, let me just add an exclamation point at the end. That's classic selfish behavior, not understanding what those second and third order effects are. And also, from a security perspective, when it comes to uh, trying to promote a security posture, nobody wants to be strong-armed. Everybody wants to feel like that they're part of a team, that they're included in the process, that they had some sort of say. So that's also something really important to recognize. The heart of the matter, and I know I'm breathing through this, this is a really short amount of time to talk about a really complicated subject, but mitigating and compensating controls. You often see this terminology uh, in terms of risk management. It's not something that we really talk about from a technical perspective a lot in an IT department, Mitigating controls being your, I would say, normal day-to-day -day controls that are meant to reduce the chances of a threat being exploited. Your firewalls, your antivirus, um, usually there's a whole list of, diff of key and general controls that are applied to an environment to reduce risk. The whole point of the controls is to reduce risk. Compensating controls is what happens when good doesn't always win. It's those controls that you're applying when you can't apply the recommended security control. So these are a couple of, of examples from a, a YouTube presentation. I put that link down there. Um, I have the management operational and technical controls under the compensation controls, but keep in mind that that also applies to mitigating controls as far as the type of controls. Management controls, that can be policies and procedures, um, there's, so there's the all the way from the technical and operative to some of the um, indirect ones like documentation. One of the examples that I thought was really interesting here is the second one on segregation of duties. A lot of times segregation of duties already has some sort of um, management directive documentation control. Video surveillance, I thought, was an interesting way of ha having that be a compensating control. You already have a directive that you're going to have a separation of duties. So then that video surveillance is that secondary control in which you can look at to make sure that the right things are happening. It's, it's, it's not something that, uh, when, I, when I was doing research for this, I thought that that was an interesting twist. Not many people would think about that as a compensating control. Uh, and also uh, MFA for each application. Maybe the weight of implementing that is too heavy. So instead having general network access control with multi-factor authentication is a way, it's secondary, it's slightly indirect, but it still reduces the risk, which is the important part. All right, that was super fast for me. I'm sure it probably was for you too. In summary, no is rarely simply a no. There is tons of other things that we're probably not thinking about from a security perspective when someone tells us, no, we're not going to be able to have that tool, we're not going to be able to implement 
that system, that process. It's not an IT department or senior leadership being obtuse. There's probably reasons for that. Understanding the IT landscape and the human landscape is going to help you understand why maybe they're saying no in this particular situation. And if first you don't succeed, try compensating controls. And thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Any questions for me or comments? Cheers, jeers. I'll take them all. Yes, sir. Uh, from those no's, do you generally get like a negotiation of what can we try instead? Right? If somebody says, we don't want this control, you go, well, what can we do? Right? Or is they, do they just come back with no and stop you from even investigating further? Rarely, and maybe in the past, um, maybe earlier on in information security, you might have gotten a no because, especially from a non tech perspective, people would just be like, oh, that seems, do we really need that? You know? Um, kind of question, but nowadays I don't think that it's like that. I think that security is generally, everybody is more used to security being, having a seat at the table now, and typically they're not just wanting you to spend money for the sake of spending money. So I think a lot of times it's, no, I don't think that that's possible, and usually someone at that table is like, well, what about this? Um, I. I think generally everybody understands it's for the good of the business and the organization, and so you do have um, a, a good team dynamic there, I think, in most places. Thanks for that. Anyone else? So when you, let's, let's say that you have, you work in an environment where you're told that leadership is concerned and Really, I'm speaking for myself, but that's the reason why your position exists. But you feel that they're looking at the wrong things. So they say that they're concerned, and they thank you for your contributions, but let's say the metrics that they are interested in are in fact the wrong things. There are so many other things that you want them to be looking at because based upon the business, it's higher risk or whatever. So how would you go about shifting that perspective for them? That's a good question. I think a lot of times it depends on who, where that department is, you know, where that department sits in the business, what that team is. I think sometimes what you see is maybe that is a risk department, and they're looking at the risk from a business perspective as a whole. So where is this little security piece fit in to the whole risk enterprise? Um, and I, I talk a lot about speaking the same language as whoever is in the room. And I always use risk as an example because I think that it's a, a really great one because I think as um, IT professionals, we're not used to explaining things in terms of risk and impact. But in this situation, being prepared to explain that in terms of business risk and impact is really where you're going to be able to uh, get them to understand where their priorities lie. And I talk sometimes, business justifications are definitely a thing. And it might be that you're absolutely told, I get it, yes, it's important. It's not that important in the grand scheme of things. And in those situations, my whole thing is then we just need to document it. If you're going to sign off on it, especially as a senior leader or as an executive, you know what? I'm going to be okay with that because the business is covered as a whole. I don't have to get what I want. The important thing is that you understand my position on this and then whatever action you take, we have it documented somewhere. So if something does happen or an examination or an audit, everyone is covered. Does that answer your question? Awesome. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, thank you, All Vanessa. Right. Great thank talk. You. Thank you, everyone, for coming.